Hello viewers, I am your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show with Afghanistan where the spate of terror continues in different forms and manifestations. In two separate terror attacks in Ghazni and Herat provinces of Afghanistan, more than two dozen people were killed and scores of others were injured. While the Islamic State that has successfully made footprints in the country has been targeting the civilians and others alike, Taliban also continues to attack the security forces and their installations. A report. Taliban, the insurgent group and the primary force behind the destabilization of a large part of Afghanistan, attacked a security compound in Khwaja Omari district of Ghajni province, killing more than a dozen security personnel and wounding several others. Insurgents, who are said to have control over large parts of the region, also torched the district headquarters. The attack came in the wake of ramped up airstrikes by US backed Afghan Air Force, which had killed around 20 Taliban commanders a few days back. The militants killed District Governor Ali Dost Shams, his bodyguards, several police officers and five government intelligence agents. While expressing its grief over the incident, the government claimed that it had killed more than 40 people in the encounter that began in the wee hours of 12 April. Taliban, however, in a statement later said that it had killed more than 20 security personnel in what was considered the safest district of the province. In another attack preceding the Taliban one, at least eight people, including children, were killed and several others wounded as a bomb exploded in a three-wheel vehicle near a mosque in Shindan district of country's western Herat province. <laughs> Afghanistan's fragile security has been unable to contain the rapidly rising violence in the country. More than 200 people have died in Kabul alone this year in attacks by Islamic State affiliate and Taliban. While the world was calling the peace offer to the Taliban as a major breakthrough in bringing an end to the years of war, the surge in the ground and air offensive against the insurgents seemed to have its own fallouts. Afghanistan's air force, backed by US-led NATO coalition advisors, has accelerated aerial raids in the country in recent months to push the Taliban to the negotiating table. Last week, dozens of civilians, including children, were killed in an Afghan air attack on a gathering at the religious school in the northern province of Kunduz. Meanwhile, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani has urged security forces to be cautious while targeting the insurgents holed up in the civilian areas. The statement came after his government was criticized by the international media and human rights organizations around the world. Moving on, the India-Nepal decades-old Bonhomi got a fresh boost as Nepalese Prime Minister K.P. Oli travelled India for his maiden foreign visit. It was not just an occasion when bilateral relations between two countries were reviewed, but commitments towards working together for mutual benefits were also made. Millions in India and Nepal who share centuries-old historical, cultural and people-to-people -people relations are going to have an improved life with the projects and pipeline becoming a reality. A report. A treaty visit of the newly elected Nepal's Prime Minister to India provided him an appropriate political and diplomatic atmosphere to narrow down any personal differences and further bolster Indo-Nepal ties that have remained intact for years. Ali, who got a sweeping mandate in recent elections on his development pitch, has pledged to work with all neighboring countries to bring prosperity to his own country. India, which has been its all-weather friend and strategic ally, has committed him to achieve his objectives. Both the countries have agreed to build a strategic railway link between border district of India, Raksol and Kathmandu in Nepal to enhance people-to-people -people contact and allow bulk cargo movement. We have developed our friendship according to the needs of times 
and according to the desires of our people with purpose to eliminate eradicate poverty improve the lifestyle of our people both countries have also reaffirmed their commitment in working together towards various other sectors from improving trade to stressing on an improved hydropower production Oli, who has been under constant media scrutiny for his apparent proximity to Beijing, emphasized his government's commitment of working with both India and China without giving any undue favor to any of the two. He reiterated his firm commitment in bringing prosperity to his own country with the help of both China neighbors. They are developed, uh, they are advanced than us and uh, they are bigger in size, population, and ahead in development process. So we want to take uh, opportunity to work together with both of our neighbors. The visit that came at a time when Napoli's leadership was seemingly getting closer to Beijing has been declared fruitifurious and satisfying by Oli himself after returning to his home. He apprised his nation that both countries had reached a consensus of resolving all the mutual concerns through cooperative engagements. In 2016, Beijing agreed to allow Nepal to use its ports to trade goods with third countries, ending the latest sole dependence on India for overland trade. Nepal last year joined the Belt and Road Initiative, which is China's effort to develop a modern sail road connecting Asia with Europe, Middle East and Africa by road, railway, sea and air. However, India still remains Nepal's biggest trade partner, toner and the supplier of the bulk of consumer goods. Both countries have committed to raise their trade exponentially in coming time. Moving on. Now we take you to Pakistan's Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province where the ethnic Pashtun community has launched a protest against the Pakistan army. Recently, several rallies were carried out in Peshawar city demanding an end of the army oppression and forced abductions in the province. A report. Thousands assembled in Peshawar city for a gathering organized by the Pashtun Tehfuz movement in what seemed like a major uprising against the Pakistani government and its military established from the Pashtun tribes. Women, children and students reached the venue with photographs of their loved ones who have been missing as a result of forced abductions which they claim have been done by the Pakistan armed forces. The demands of this movement is genuinely under the constitution of Pakistan. The, they want to release all abducted or missing person, those who are uh, in the custody of security agencies. The long march towards Islamabad is the second episode of the uprising continuing from where it left off. That is, its first long march against the extrajudicial killing of Nakibullah Mesud, a young boy who was killed in a fake encounter in Karachi by the then senior superintendent of police, Rao Anwar. The protest, which lasted weeks, staged outside the National Press Club in Islamabad, ended after an agreement with the government who promised to ensure Rao Anwar is arrested. Hundreds of people from federally administered tribal areas or FATA who got injured due to the ongoing military operation were promised compensation in form of recovery of missing persons abducted by the army and removal of landmines from residential areas in FATA. Demands are still remaining. One is to clear the fort up from landmines. The second one is to uh, to to arrange a judicial inquiry of extrajudicial killing. The third one is to, uh, to provide the list of missing person if they are innocent to, to release them or if they are criminal then bring them to justice. 
Various outlets in Pakistan have blamed Pashtun Tehfuz movement for being supported by Afghanistan. Pashtun Tehfuz movement says they were well aware of the government's failure but still gave them time to live up to their word. The Pashtun resistance is likely to escalate as army's brutal repression in tribal areas of Balochistan and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa continues. To speak more on this, we are now joined by Fazalul Rehman Afridi, a Pashtun human rights activist. Mr. Afridi, give us a sense of Pashtun issue which has been shaping up into a rebellion. Actually, the problem of uh, Pakistani state oppression and the military operations, they have been going on for quite a long time. But uh, the Pashtuns, due to fear, as they have been labelled as terrorists by the Pakistani state and the international community has also accepted this wrong version of the Pakistani military establishment. So they were in fear. They could not come out to express themselves. And the, on the other side, the civilian government of Pakistan was also abetting the military establishment uh, in oppressing the Pashtun people, in arbitrary detentions, in enforced disappearances, abductions and torture, and extrajudicial killing. So the people were in fear. Actually in Fata, especially I'll talk about Fata because this movement uh, rose in the tribal areas of Pakistan. Because the, the North Wazistan and South Wazistan, they were really subjected to uh, inhuman treatment by the Pakistani military establishment that about 1 million people have been displaced and 65 to 70,000 people have been killed by the military establishment. Pakistan has denied all your allegations and has said that it is only carrying out operations against the terrorists hiding in the Fata region. What's your say on that? Yes, that is the uh, irony of the fact. It's really irony because Pakistan is playing a double game with the United States and international community. Instead of targeting the real terrorists, the real Taliban who are destabilizing Afghanistan, they are targeting the civilian people. They are destroying uh, the properties and uh, the shops of the civilian people. Not a single. Have you heard any t uh, in any uh, uh, news? that a uh, Taliban leader was killed in uh, the frontier region and in Fata. Have you ever heard that Al-Qaeda leaders were arrested? <laughs> Even Bin Laden was, uh, uh, besides the Pakistani military academy, he was captured there by Americans, not by Pakistanis. So it, it's a wrong version of the Pakistani story. So it's not a fact. They never killed the Taliban. They supported the Taliban to use them against uh, like Lashkar Tayyaba and the others against India and the Pakistani Taliban against Afghanistan. Tell our viewers how Pakistan has been nurturing terrorism inside its boundaries and using it to destabilize Afghanistan. The Haqqani network is there. They have been uh, there, they are training their people to send them to Afghanistan to destabilize uh, Afghanistan. Their leadership is there, their leadership is in Islamabad. The Haqqani network leadership is in Islamabad. The Taliban's uh, are in Quetta, everybody knows about it. So the Afghanistan claims that Taliban's in, in Pakistan, it's true. And Pakistan is using these Taliban's for, for Pakistan, these are good Taliban's. So they are using them uh, for their strategic depth uh, and to create uh, instability in Afghanistan. Thank you, Mr. Afridi. Pakistan is under a constant vigil for its increasingly complicit role in promoting and nurturing terrorism in South Asia and around the globe. It has repeatedly been reprimanded by its close strategic partner for its attempt to mainstream deadly terrorists. Its government has failed to implement constitution in its true spirit in the country and in fact has been acting as a stooge of the military. Its army is involved in heinous human rights offences. Tribal people are constantly getting oppressed by the state authorities. Any reasonable voice speaking against the incompetent and inefficient system has been shown the doors. Today's Let's See How Pakistan is Cruising Towards Becoming a Failed State. 
Pakistan has virtually failed in every sphere today and with its name appearing in the global financial watchdog, financial action task force, grey list, clouds of global sanctions are looming over it. Despite getting repeated warnings, Pakistan has been providing its own territory for the nurturing of terrorists to wage a war against India and Afghanistan along its border. A global terrorist is given hospitality similar to that of a state guest. While on the other side, Pakistan's former envoy to the United States, Hussein Haqqani, who served Pakistan for years, has been shown closed doors for voicing his analysis of prevailing circumstances in the country. When somebody has been declared a terrorist by the global community, then all countries should act against such a person. And Pakistan also needs to take steps that will redeem it in the eyes of the world, not be stuck with the label of uh, dragging its feet in dealing with people who uh, do not have a good reputation in the rest of the world. Now, if Pakistan's government or Pakistan's courts or Pakistan's political or military leadership feels that there is no evidence against Hafiz Saeed, then they should ask the international community to provide the evidence that uh, Pakistan needs uh, to deal with this. But international opinion should not be flouted in the manner in which it has been by Pakistan in relation to Hafiz Saeed. Government of Pakistan doesn't seem to have any sway over the army generals and country's secret agency ISI as it has failed to take any strict actions against the rising clout of dreaded terrorists like Hafiz Saeed who have got the backing of Pakistan army. Mili Muslim League, a political disguise of Lashkar e Toiba, despite facing a strong resistance, has managed to make inroads into the political system of Pakistan. As far as the Milli Muslim League is concerned, the United States has already recognized it just as another name for lashkar e -Taiba. One can keep changing the name many times, but unless you change your actions, changing names will not change the reality. And when somebody has been considered and described as a terrorist by the international community, uh, trying to mainstream that and them is going to be problematic for Pakistan in terms of its relations with several countries of the world. Pakistan, an economically failed state, has also launched a multi-pronged proxy attack against its neighbours, India and Afghanistan, and has constantly been sending its cannon fodder across the border to destabilise these peaceful countries. Terrorism has become an issue that is now hurting not only India-Pakistan relations but also US-Pakistan relations and many other countries uh, are becoming negative in their approach to Pakistan. We saw on the occasion of the Financial Action Task Force uh, making a, a judgment about Pakistan, uh, putting Pakistan on the grey list that there were several countries that took an interest in it not just the United States and certainly not India. So Pakistan will have to change that perception around the world. Pakistan is not just developing as a threat to its neighbours but has also meted out inhuman treatment to its own citizens. It has launched a repressive campaign against the ethnic Baloch and Pashtuns. A no vocal attitude, blatant human rights violations and brute repressions of reasonable voices have been the story of the Pashtuns for the past seven decades and it is only getting worse with the time. These people have been marginalized from the political and social discourse of Pakistan. Although Pakistan has denied all allegations, the fact remains that these people are second-class citizens for Islamabad who can be sacrificed at any moment to meet the strategic or vicious needs of Pakistan. The Pakistani uh, uh, youth uh, from the Pashtun community have acted uh, totally spontaneously and without any serious political organization. And that basically shows how a young Pakistani population uh, is quite disgruntled with the situation that they face. Uh, the Pashtun Tahafuz movement, as it's called, uh, must be taken seriously. Uh, instead, the Pakistani deep state is describing its leaders as uh, traitors and as foreign agents. Uh, they are not foreign agents. They are people facing injustice, standing up for their rights. Uh, it's not just the Pashtuns. I think that we will see similar movements all across Pakistan because after all, the Pakistani state has for far too long ignored too many people within the country to pursue objectives that have nothing to do with providing education, healthcare and justice to the poorest of the poor. 
It is high time Pakistan alters its India-centric foreign and domestic policy and concentrates on its declining graph vis-a-vis -vis global growth rate. If the government doesn't rein in those who have been trying to subvert the democratic structure of the country, time is not far when Pakistan will be declared a terrorist state accompanied with a diplomatic and economic isolation from the world. Even the permanent allies of Pakistan have declined to support it in recent times. Moving on, years of war have destabilized the economy of Afghanistan, leaving a large section of the population unemployed. People have been forced to either take up odd jobs or to do something on their own. Amid this, however, has emerged a tale of inspiration. Frozan, a 19-year-old student, has turned the tide of tradition in Afghanistan and has become a successful entrepreneur. A report. Breaking the societal shackles of Afghan society, where it is rare to find women working outside the home, Frozan, a 19-year-old schoolgirl, is a successful entrepreneur owning 12 beehives of her own. Although the lives of women have improved significantly since the fall of Taliban regime in 2001, traditions, insecurity and recently a decline in international donors is hampering the progress. Frozan too faced familiar hindrances when she set off to realize her dreams of doing something for herself and her family. مشکلات زیاد بود چون دیگه ما که یه منطقه داریم یک چی جامعه سنتی است دیگه دخترها نمی‌تونن سان کار بکنن یا بیرون برن با یه خاطر مشکلات زیاد بود ما وقتی که کار شروع کردم دیدم آسان است با مردم گفتم مردم درک درک کنم را قبول کنم باز متن است می‌کار انجام بده. Three years ago, the then 16-year-old got a loan, bought two beehives, and learned everything she needed to know about apiculture from an NGO. The bees collected nectar from the flowers growing near her house in the north of the country and Frozan collected 16 kilograms of honey in the first season which enabled her to pay back the loan and still make a profit. She now has 12 beehives and last year collected around 110 kilograms of honey. This brought her an income of 1450 US dollars, a sizable sum considering that the country's GDP per capita is around 600 US dollars per year. ما می خوام که داینده ای زنبورداری جاد پیشرفت کنم و تجارتم خوب شوه. ما علاقمندی هستم که اقتصاد بخوانم و یک تجارت پیشه شوه. Her father Ismail, who is a farmer like much of the population in the Marmul district of Afghan's Balkh province, has been her staunch supporter from the start. Every few weeks he takes the freshly extracted honey and goes to mazar sharif the provincial capital more than 50 kilometers away. It's sold to shops and consumed mainly by local customers who have no idea that the honey they are eating was produced by a teenage girl. از اینکه وقتی که پروژه که در اینجا آمد خود فروزان جان علاقه گرفت و ما هم خوش شدم که بعد اولادی داشته باشم که بتونه در پیشه دست پیدا کنه و در آینده زندگیش به درد بخوره. Media reports say honey production has been on the rise in Afghanistan with production reaching 2000 tons in 2015. Several varieties of honey ranging from acacia, almond flower to basil are available. Most of this honey never leaves Afghanistan due to limited infrastructure for processing and exporting. Shopkeepers complain that government has been importing poor quality of honey from other countries when a better quality is available in the country itself. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.